Welcome to Kibbe on Liberty. This week, Michael Abramowitz, president of the Freedom House. They have a new scorecard looking at the rise of authoritarianism. And we're going to talk specifically about Chinese oppression of the Uyghur minority and the social credit system and what a leaderless bottom-up mo grassroots movement could do to stop oppression. Check it out. Michael, good to see you again. Great to see you, Matt. It's been a while. Yes, I'm um, sorry I've missed you at our collaboratories. Yes, um, we, you and I met at something called the Civic Collaboratory, uh, hosted by our friend Eric Liu. And I think we've known each other three or four years now, um, starting when you were at the, the Holocaust Museum. Correct. Um, but why don't you introduce yourself and give us a little bit of history about who you are, and then I want to talk about the Freedom House, you're, you're, where you're currently president. Okay, so I'm, uh, my background is really start as a journalist. I was for almost 25 years a journalist at the uh, Washington Post. I covered politics, I covered healthcare, I covered business, I, I was an editor for a while. And then a little more than 10 years ago, I had a radical change in my life and I decided to kind of be on the more uh, active doing side than the, than the reporting. So the advocacy I, side, yeah. The advocacy side. So I. Uh, I, I worked, as you say, at the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. for about uh, eight years, which uh, was, was fantastic. It's an incredible institution. And I focused on uh, issues uh, like the prevention of genocide and also education about the Holocaust. Uh, I also oversaw our exhibitions at the, at the, at the museum. And uh, that was great. So then I got onto my third career, which is running Freedom House. And mm -hmm. we can, Talk a little bit about Freedom House. Yeah, and where would you put yourself on on the political spectrum now that you're an advocate? Well, as an advocate, we're nonpartisan. I'm nonpartisan. I mean, I would say, uh, yeah, I'm fairly middle of the road. I think uh, uh, I, you know, when I was a journalist, uh, I uh, I was an independent, mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, and I've tended not to get involved in camp in political campaigns. I've, I've got. I've got one or two friends who have been in politics. I like to help my friends, but yeah. but but certainly at Freedom House over the last three years, I stay away from partisan politics. Yeah, and I I do have a uh, ancient political background, but I, I I really try not to do it now because yes. because I want to I definitely want to speak to people that you know once they decide that you're a Republican or a Democrat or a conservative or a progressive, they they may be less inclined to listen to it if it's not something that they're sort of predisposed to hear. Absolutely, and I think that, and I think you know, the issues that we work on at Freedom House, whether it's freedom of the press or freedom of association or freedom of religion, uh, transparency, rule of law, these are issues that at least should not be partisan issues, and so we want to get support from across the political aisle yeah. for those for, for our for our work on those issues. And there's a there's I, I didn't know this until until I attended a meeting that you hosted about a year ago, but there is a long history at Freedom House and, and tell us tell us where it came from and and why it matters. Yeah, no, the history is very interesting, I think. Uh, uh, we were founded, we're probably the oldest or the longest standing uh, human rights slash democracy group in the United States. We were founded in 1941. And we were founded before Pearl Harbor. Uh, and really, we were founded when there was a huge America First movement. Uh, it's, it's kind of interesting, because most of my contemporaries yeah. don't know that actually America First has a different connotation. Yeah. But yeah. There, was a very, there was a very strong movement of kind of isolationism uh, during the 1930s and late and early 40s. And Freedom House really uh, brought people together from across the political spectrum to try to really get America into the war against fascism. That was the animating principle of Freedom House. And uh, uh, it was a number of journalists and other uh, prominent individuals who came together. The, it was interesting, the patrons of Freedom House uh, were Eleanor Roosevelt and Wendell Wilkie. Now, Wendell Wilkie, Eleanor was the first lady, and Wendell Wilkie was really a very interesting American politician who had run on the Republican ticket Against Eleanor, uh, against Eleanor's husband in 1940, and uh, and so the two of them kind of came together 
uh, to be backers of Freedom House. And that's really the ethos of Freedom House, uh, getting Democrats, Republicans, uh, and uh, people across the aisle to support the core principles of, of, of really in the early days fighting fascism, then fighting communism, and then really more generally supporting uh, uh, the defense of democracy. I would say, you know, when, when I tell people that I work at Freedom House, a lot of people who are like older, you know, think of us a little bit as a Cold War organization. In the 60s, 70s, 80s, we were fiercely anti-communist. Uh, we were, um, we had some very prominent individuals you know, like Irving Kristol, who are of the right, who were uh, uh, trustees of Freedom House. Also, the very famous civil rights activist, Bayard Rustin, uh, was, was on the board of Freedom House. And he was sort of, in some ways, I think his politics were kind of Freedom House politics. He was a strongly pro-civil rights, uh, uh, pro, uh, pro-civil liberties at home, but he was a fierce anti-communist. And he would, in the old days, would lead Freedom House missions to uh, countries that were having... Uh, elections and stuff. So, the, 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 I would say the tradition is 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 nonpartisan and bipartisan, probably a little bit more center right mm-hmm. than center left. I think in, in recent years we've got on our board uh, both Republicans and Democrats. Our, our current board chairman is Michael Chertoff, uh, a, a Republican, but we also have Democrats and people who've served in different administrations. Okay, and. And uh, yeah, I was particularly uh, struck during that conversation that we had a year ago about the the use of the phrase liberal democracy. And, and of course, both of those words are, are, are loaded terms depending on what you mean by those things. But as you guys talked about it, I, I realized that, that for conservatives and, and sort of uh, small government libertarianish types, um, they might use a different phrase that in a lot of ways means the same thing, you know, constitutional republicanism, because it's, it's liberal democracy, but a key part of that is the rule of law. Yeah. Well, I've really thought about the, the, the phrase liberal democracy, and I do recognize that in the current environment, it's not maybe the best phrase, but it's really about classical liberalism. And by that, I mean having free and fair elections but also the core principles that animate a democracy, freedom of expression, freedom of speech, uh, freedom of association, uh, the rule of law. Uh, these are really the core uh, organizing principles of, of the way we think at Freedom House. Yeah. And uh, where it comes together, uh, and we can move to this if, you, if, you, if you'd like, is you know uh, the thing that we're probably best known for we do a number of things. We we support human rights activists overseas in many different ways. We advocate for policies uh, that support human rights and these core principles before the Congress and other forum. But we have an annual survey called Freedom in the World, which is kind of our our brand, if you will. And uh, I just broke the first rule of podcasting. And it's actually Logan's fault that he didn't tell me to turn my phone off. <laughs> Sorry about that. I turned my phone off without Logan telling me. <laughs> um, I, uh, uh, but, but we have this report that we've been doing every year since 1973 uh, in which we rank every country in the world, uh, more than 200, uh, according to these uh, core principles. Yeah. And, and, and I just had uh, a couple weeks ago, Ladon Boromond, who you've, have you just told me you've done some work with and she's what i would call a human rights activist from iran uh she would call herself a social democrat and and um we we mostly agreed on the really big things that matter right now in terms of human rights abuses and suppression of of speech and 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 opposition in iran and i said eventually when we fix all those problems let's let's have a nice argument about about how big the government should be and how involved it should be in, in all of the things that, that we might disagree on. Um, but this, the, the, yeah, I love, I, I just read the report and I, I love the title this year as, as a former community organizer myself, the title this year, and by the way, this is subversively libertarian title, so you guys better watch out, <laughs> a leaderless struggle for democracy. And this is the 2020 freedom in the world uh, ranking. Um, tell, tell me about that theme first. Well, it's interesting. You know, I think people can read that in different ways. 
I think what we had in mind is that, uh, well, first of all, our report is just out um, uh, early March. And so we've just put it up on the website, freedomhouse.org. And so it's downloadable for free. And it's downloadable for free. But I would also encourage people, if they're interested, to look at it online because we've actually done a lot of work on both uh, a website redesign and also the back end to make it easier to search and compare. So it's a much better interactive experience. Um, I'm sorry, remind me of the question again. I just... Oh, we're talking about the, the name. Oh, 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 Lilo's oh, Struggle yeah. for so, Democracy. So, Lilo's Struggle for Democracy. So, I think the issue, one of the major themes of the report this year was the fact that there are these protest movements all over the world. Yeah. Uh, you have probably the most famously in Hong Kong, where three million people uh, hit the streets last summer to really insist on their rights. Uh, and to me, that was one of the most moving events uh, in a long time, absolutely, because these are people who have everything to lose, but really, by the way, they're very inspired by our country too. Yeah, you know, without you know much you know interference or approach, I I, mean, I really think the United States has kind of been hands off, but despite what the conspiracy theorists, yeah. they, people look to the United States, and that's very inspiring. But you have Hong Kong, uh, you have Sudan, where there was a peaceful revolt that resulted in the. Uh, uh, the ouster of the longtime dictator there. There have been protests in Iran, Russia, Lebanon, Iraq, Bolivia. Really, there are many countries that have, that, that, I mean, it was a, something happened in the last year yeah. uh, that caused this. And I think, I think what's interesting, when we, when we use the word elitist struggle, I think, I think we had two things in mind. One was that actually, in some of these cases, these are authentic bottom up movements. Yeah. Uh, you know, in Hong Kong in particular, you know, there is no single leader. Uh, you know, a lot of this stuff is uh, being done uh, uh, through online communications and crowdsourcing. And, you know, there's not like a, a Mandela or a, or a Valencia kind of orchestrating things. Yeah. Um, so that's one element of this. I think the other element of it is that I think we do see... Um, and I want to be careful here, but I do, but I, I do believe this: that there is a, a lack of support from the world's democracies in these protest movements. Um, you know, it's not the major thing that you know Great Britain or America or France or Germany are thinking about these days. You know, the countries that are blessed with, with freedom, we think are you know are not showing leadership in in really defending the rights of these protesters. So I think those were the sense in which we thought this this year. Yeah, and I think it's it's there's a there's a line there that I, that I struggle with as a, as a libertarian, and I don't really think that America's foreign policy should be as world policeman or enforcer of of our democratic values because I think I think it becomes a very quickly a slippery slope where we we make things worse a lot of times when we do stuff like that. But um, on the other hand, and in, in in cases like China and Hong Kong, um, I don't think it's helpful when President Trump. Um, sends uh, President Xi uh, a uh, love Twitter that says, uh, congratulations on whatever the anniversary of, of communism in China is. I, that's, that's a very un-Reagan thing to do. And it, there's, a, there's a balance between being sort of needlessly antagonistic towards uh, countries where, where you should have uh, diplomatic communications and then the conversation should be going without just giving them a blank check yeah. Um, Kim Jong Un and and you know some of the stuff that Trump has said about him, and but back to this title and, and why I love it so much is I think I think the real power um, against authoritarianism ultimately depends on on people taking that risk and rising up the way that Hong Kongers are doing, um, and we can support that and at you know at, at Free the People we've we've done a bunch of videos on yeah. on Hong Kong and and yes they're embracing these idealistic American values about, about liberty and pluralism and, and speech and autonomy. And, and, and we, should, we should celebrate them very publicly so that everyone in the world knows where we stand. Right. I completely agree with that. I, I think it's a very profound challenge for those of us who really believe in classical liberal democracy that, we're, that we've been talking about, that the last 15 or 20 years in particular, but really the sweep of U.S. foreign policy over 75 or 80 years as we've gotten more engaged in the world, you know, 
we've definitely, you know, there have been mistakes, I think, and, and, and overreach. But I think we have to get across the idea that supporting democracy is not just military intervention. It's just making clear where your allegiances are. Uh, I'm very intrigued. There's a lot of uh, new uh, non-military tactics that that can be used. Um, so I, th- I think it's very important for uh, for us when we when we when we try to get support for this that we talk first of all about de- democracy support, not promotion, because we're supporting people, uh, but they have to make the decisions for themselves about the society they want to live in. Yeah. But that we're also um, that we're not trying to impose our own way of doing things on them, that we, we that, that it's up to them. I mean, that's what's really, very, by the way, to me, very inspiring about what happened in Sudan. You know, in Sudan, it's a very kind of uh, interesting story that I think is is indicative of, of, of the situation, whereas, you know, it was, it was a, group, a group of professionals, doctors, lawyers, who were, and others, who really tapped into a deep discontent with the kind of corruption of the system and the fact that the government was not delivering on the economic promises that they had delivered. And, you know, they didn't have a lot of support from outside. On their own, they rose up. And uh, I think when that happens, it's up to us to be able to be supportive of them, but we can't be superimposing yeah. Our, yeah. Our, our values on them. Yeah, well, one of the things that, that I think drives a lot of this, and you could go back, you know, in the American context, uh, go all the way back to Howard Dean, but of course, the Tea Party and Ron Paul, and and in, in different ways, both Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders, these are in large part technology-driven movements. Obviously, when it comes to candidates, it's 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 more top-down by definition. Um, but these leaderless movements all over the world, um, you know, the Arab Spring and uh, the pushback in in Ukraine against Russia, and you could go on and on and on. Everything that you've just mentioned, yeah. this is the upside: the democratization of technology that yes. that gives people voice. Um, but there's a downside, and and your study talks about about what's going on in China as as one instance. But these authoritarian regimes, the first thing they do is they try to shut down social media. Yes. If if people are smart enough and they are smart enough to using encrypted alternatives, they shut down the internet. And like it's this it's this sort of arms race to to against the democratization of technology by authoritarians. Well what's interesting, Matt, is roughly ten years ago when the protests in Tahir Square happened. And the protesters kind of used Facebook very effectively to to marshal uh, opposition to the Mubarak regime, and then eventually topple the regime. I think many of us felt—I was a reporter at the time; I wasn't in the—but I think many of us felt at the time that hey, technology is this like unalloyed good, right? Yeah. That it's going to be this this powerful source of uh, liberation. Uh, for oppressed peoples around the world. And by the way, there's still some truth to that. Uh, You know, I I often think of like in Russia, where Putin has done a very good job of kind of co-opting opposition. But, you know, the fact that people were able to expose the corruption of the system using YouTube and getting, you know, hundreds of thousands of viewers of that is 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 a sign that still technology can be a powerful force. However, I think what we're seeing is that the bad guys have also figured it out. Mm-hmm. And so there's all sorts of different tools that they now have to kind of push back against the openness, right? So they can, you know, they can surveil you online. They can, I mean, the, the Chinese have done an incredible job of the so-called great Chinese firewall, where they literally employ millions of people to prevent uh, uh, the Chinese people from accessing websites or information that they don't want them to achieve. And, they, and they've actually done it yeah. pretty effectively. I, I continue to be thinking about, I'm going to get this quote slightly wrong, but you know, when the Internet first uh, started, you know, Bill Clinton said, hey, this is going to be the opening of China. You know, there's no way they can control the internet. It's gonna be like trying to nail Jello to the wall, but they did. They figured it out. Yeah. Well, they've, and they've. We should point out that they've had um, way too much cooperation from American companies that that want 
access to that massive marketplace for their for their platforms. Yes, I mean I would say in general, without saying specifically to the tech companies, although you could say that the tech companies, there is a the interest in the Chinese market from American companies, whether it's the NBA, whether it's you know Google and Facebook and Microsoft, or whether it's uh, you know Marriott. I mean, really, it's 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 across the board, and I think. In some in some ways, I think that's a real profound challenge because these companies, you know, are in some ways the biggest uh, uh, pushers back against the idea of really calling out China for human rights and yeah. abuses. Well, they're afraid to, and you could you could see that with the NBA that um, they were they were kind of doing what um, she wanted them to do. But there was also an interesting case with Marriott. A couple of years ago, I don't know if you remember this, no. but 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 essentially, the there was a low-level Marriott employee who referred to I'm for, really forgetting whether it was Taiwan or Tibet, but he on like an internal blog he referenced you know a country in a way that was not politically correct as far as the Chinese are concerned, and the, and China had to ba- China basically shut down. The Marriott website in China totally apologize for it. Yeah. So it's it's you know it's I think it's I think it's really important. I think one thing that would be good to see over the next uh, number of years is for American companies to kind of show some greater solidarity for each other because they can be picked off. Yeah. You know, if, if one company they can pressure one company, but if every company says, "Hey, you know, we're not you know we recognize that you're not going to accept free speech in your country, but." But we have free speech here in the United States. We're not going to. Yeah. We're not going to inhibit that. I think that'd be great. Well, the you know the the uh, the backlash to the NBA, I think, gets back to this lead, leaderless struggle for democracy. Because I think, in one sense, the the Chinese marketplace um, is compromising uh, American companies to to sort of take a dive on questions of speech and privacy. Conversely. Um, Maybe that market power is is potentially a force for good, and and the way that we as citizens of of the United States and of the world um, pressure uh, governments and and companies to do the right thing is to talk about this stuff and to shed light on it and to hold them to the standards that 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 you lay out in this report. I I tend to be kind of um, not not just romantic, but I I, I don't think I know that there's a perfect top-down solution to any of this, even if you had the ability to do such a thing. I think it's, I think the responsibility's on the individual to, to step up, to speak up. And technology, the upside of technology is that we can all tell this story, and that puts pressure on American companies to uh, how they behave in not just Chinese markets, but all of these countries where human rights abuses are happening. Right. I don't know if you buy that, but I... And maybe I'm maybe I'm too naive about this, but I I do think it starts with us and not um, not Congress. I'm not exactly sure what you're asking, but I certainly feel that um, I I do think that change starts with with individuals. Yeah. Right. It's not going to start with a. In some cases, maybe a staffer or something, but. But but really, it's 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 individuals who are, you know, pushing for the change they want. You know, whether it's you know Martin Luther King or Phyllis Schlafly or, or whoever it is. Yeah. You, know, you know, we have a we, you know U.S. history is replete with individuals who have made a real difference. Yeah, yeah, and I, I I probably shocked you with my crazy libertarian ideas that that we can solve everything from the bottom up. But uh, I, I, I I'm even, not saying you're wrong, man. I, I'm, just, yeah. I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just I'm trying to get my head around the fact of. I mean, I certainly think that in in my line of work, you know, the the you know the kind of power and influence that's shown by individuals, whether it's the Hong Kong protesters or the Sudan protesters, protesters, or by the way, even someone like Bill Browder. Uh, I don't know if you do you know who Bill Browder is. Mm-mm. Bill Browder, he's an amazing person, some of the Freedom House has worked with in the past. He was um, essentially a Russian, he, he was an investor in Russia in the 1990s. He was a, an investor, and he made a lot of money sort of investing in Russia, 
buying up cheap stocks in the uh, aftermath of the uh, of the fall of the Berlin Wall and the collapse of communism in Russia. And Bills kind of ran afoul of the Russian government by calling out some of the cases of corruption. And he kind of came effectively like an enemy of the state. And he got out of Russia, but his 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 assistant, his his lawyer, a guy named Sergei Magnitsky, that now that name may ring a bell, Magnitsky was arrested by the Russians and basically he died in a Russian jail being tortured by by the Russians. And that catalyzed Bill to launch really a movement. We supported it, but but I my hat's off to Bill, he really did it, you know, to, to kind of push Congress to impose first sanctions on the Russian government and the people that were involved in his friend's death. But then he really pushed for the creation of a new law that would allow the U.S. government, and by the way, this law is going on in other countries too, but to impose financial sanctions on the most egregious human rights abusers and, uh, and uh, uh, human rights violators. You know, Bill, he's got a lot of money, but he's basically done it from, from his office in England with a small staff and really the power of a story yeah. it's, and, and, you know, the power of his friend and what happened to his friend is a very, mo- is very moving. So I think there's a lot that individuals can do. Yeah. Yeah. Big time. Well, let's, um, let's lay out the, the basic criteria for the report. And then I, then I want to dig a little bit de- deeper into China and India and some of the countries that, that are featured in, in the narrative. Right. Well, let me give you, if I could, let me give you the big picture of the report. Okay. Because we've been doing this really every year f- since the since the early 70s. And what we do is we look at every country in the world and we we basically rate every country uh, against a series of metrics. Uh, there are 24 indicators that we use. Uh, there, uh, some of them are political liberties, some of them are civil liberties. But we, but we look at uh, the things I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, the content of elections, uh, whether a country has safeguards against corruption, uh, how well the rule of law is observed, is there an independent judiciary, um, is there freedom of expression, is there a free press, is there freedom of religion, is there a freedom of belief, is there academic freedom? There's about 24 different things. If you go to our website, which is brand new, you can see very explicitly what our criteria are. And then we basically give us assign a score on a zero to 100 of every country in the world for how, uh, uh, for how they're doing, zero being the worst, 100 being the best. Uh, and then we, uh, and we do that every year. And then we group these countries into green countries. We do a map, and the green countries are the, are the, are the ones that are free. Uh, the yellow countries are the ones that are partly free. And the purple countries are the ones that are uh, not free. If I could give you like the the, the the precy of the story for the last 50 years, when we first started doing this report in the early 70s, uh, much of the world was living under communist dictatorship. You also had uh, military dictatorships in part of the world. It was really kind of a grim time. And you had for the next three decades or so, a dramatic wave of democratization, starting in Portugal in 1974, which got rid of military rule. But then you had... Uh, you know, lots of uh, 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 democracy movements, you know, culminating uh, with the fall of the Berlin Wall, you know, which brought uh, democracy to uh, Eastern Europe and, 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 and then eventually for a while, Russia. So you had sort of a really substantial advance of democracy for about 30 to 35 years. And then for the last 15 years, you've had really setbacks where you've had more countries every year experiencing uh, declines in political rights and civil liberties and improvements. We're still ahead of where we were, you know, 40 years ago, dramatically. There, you know, there are many more countries, but we're we're really now in a period of, of democratic recession. Yeah, the uh, uh, I, I was struck by so so India is still in the free category yep. in your most in your most recent report um, based on all of these criteria. But of course, there's there's tremendous backsliding and uh, Modi's. Uh, Use uh, you call it, I think correctly, Hindu nationalism is is a problem. But what what's interesting about that? It struck me as as someone that worries that the the vulgar version of democracy can lead to pretty atrocious things. And you have a eighty percent Hindu country 
what is it, 10, 11 percent Muslim country. Yeah. So, you know, majoritarian democracy could lead to horrific things. And, and it's, I haven't looked recently, but it seems like Modi's fairly popular in India right now. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, one of the things that's really hard to get across to people is that majoritarianism is not enough to have a healthy democracy. It's, uh, first of all, it's not like even healthy democracies are perfect, right? You know, we live in a country that I think by and large has a healthy democracy, but, you know, over the years we've had, you know, very significant flaws, you know, mm -hmm. whether it's the Jim Crow laws in, in the South and the, you know, after the Civil War or even slavery itself. So, you know, we have, you know, I, I really don't think it's up until, uh, you know, the, the civil rights movement succeeded that we really had a, you know, a functioning democracy. And, and even so, we're not perfect. So the point is, no one's perfect. Uh, but I think the point that's really hard to get across is that, you know, elections are not enough. There is so much that p people can do once you're in power to really restrict rights, restrict liberties, and really basically tilt the playing field so that you can stay in power indefinitely, at least try to stay in power indefinitely. And I think, you know, Russia is a good example of this, Hungary, a couple other countries where, you know, Putin, you know, became president in, you know, a constitutional way. And he won, you know, uh, election initially in a, uh, in, a, in a reasonably fair way. Uh, I think Freedom House didn't say that Russia was a perfect democracy, but it was a, but but it was a functioning democracy. But then you know he kind of uh, took over the press, right? He kind of took over the public broadcasting, and he and he made sure that his friends and cronies, you know, ran you know the main outlets, and he kind of corrupted the judiciary, uh, and he threw his political opponents in jail. Uh, so and this is like. A playbook that's being copied by other autocrats around the world. So, the long and the short of it is, is that you could have an election, yeah. but you're still not respecting the core rights and liberties that that we expect in a democracy. Which which gets to the rule of law part and exactly. And like you can have um, you can have a constitution that that lays out the perfect limits on that sort of authoritarian abuse, but it may not mean that much if there's not if there's not a sort of a, a culture and understanding supporting those restraints getting back to people holding autocrats accountable yeah rule of law is essential i mean that's really interesting you know if you look at the scores in freedom house and i'm not going to give you be able to give you chapter and verse go to the website on this but but rule of law has been one of the areas where there's been a substantial deterioration over the last 15 years yeah and that I think goes to the point that you're trying to make. Yeah, and it, I mean, and it's been th this. I'll talk about this country, and you know, there's there's certainly lots of, of people um, on the left, libertarians, that worry about expansive use of, of executive power by the Trump administration. Um, but he he didn't make that up out of whole cloth. I think there's been a deterioration of of the, and and some of it is is constitutional, but part of it was just the tradition of not crossing the line and and um, understanding that that you know congress has uh, for instance the authority to go to war congress has the power of the purse um i when mike lee senator mike lee was on we talked about this a lot um, but you know what do you do when when congress doesn't assert that authority and what do you do when uh president uh republican or democrat barack obama or donald trump um just says, I'm, I'm going to do this. And, and the, I, I worry about the, 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 the robustness of those institutions because a lot of it is not formal. A lot of it is just um, things that we just didn't do in this country. Right. I think that's a good point. I think one thing that I try to remind people is that, you know, the problems with U.S. democracy, you know, did not start... Uh, when Donald Trump became president. You know, uh, I think there have been things that we've criticized, you know, the Trump administration for. But I think you have to be honest and look, there were egregious violations of freedom uh, under previous administrations. You know, there was the mass surveillance that 
took place after 9-11 under the Bush administration. You know, Obama had you know, a nicer rhetoric towards the press, I guess, but, you know, his administration did pursue leak investigations against journalists and uh, others uh, that, you know, were an infringement, I think, on, 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 on freedom. Uh, so I think we have to remind ourselves, I, I, I think one of the points we've tried to make at Freedom House is that, you know, there have been strains on U.S. democracy that have been going on for quite some time, and it's important for people to recognize that. Yeah. Well, let, let's let's go to to India because I, mm -hmm. I think this is probably a story that me, not as many people are focused on, you know, relative to say China. But uh, uh, Modi has done a number of things to um, more than disenfranchise the the Muslim minority in that country in very authoritarian ways. Can you can you tell us a little bit about some of those things? Sure. Well, I think first of all, going to a point that you made earlier, Matt. Uh, Modi is a popular, you know. He, he's a populist, he's, yeah. He's popular, he's a populist. You know, he's won election uh, uh, in a very, in a, in a f you know, what seems to be free and fair elections. Uh, so um, I think uh, uh, you, have to, you have to give him credit for that and you have to acknowledge that. And you have to also acknowledge, I think, that the people who have the populist uh label uh, are often speaking to real grievances and real concerns of people. It's not, you know, it's not, it's not for nothing that he, that he got elected in a very, very difficult. The question is that he's done some things, you know, since uh, taking power that have really suggested that, you know, the Muslim majority, minority, excuse me, which I think is a roughly 170 million Indians believe it. That's that's a, that's, a, that's like half our country, but it's, that's it's like, a big country. It's yeah. a big country. Yeah. Uh, but that the Muslim minority has been ill treated. Um, you know, uh, there was this basically a new immigration law. Just as an example, in the last year, this is one of the things that we were concerned about. Freedom House, that basically gave uh, you know uh, special immigration status or, or rights to uh, people from around India, but not Muslims. So it's clearly discriminatory in terms of its uh, uh, effect and treatment. You know, they also had, they imposed this direct rule in, uh, in, in Kashmir, the India part of Kashmir, and uh, basically abrogated uh, the rights of, of citizens living in, in Kashmir. So there is this kind of nationalistic component. And again, nothing necessarily wrong with nationalism, but it, for freedom house, when you start impinging on people's rights, that's when we get get concerned. Yeah, and it, I mean, it does. Uh, I mean, it gets back to this majoritarian thing. But you know, when I think of the word nationalism, it's usually associated with with some sort of uh, uh, ethnic or religious tone to it, where the majority is is going to identify the the national interest in the aggregate at the expense of, of these minorities. And, it, you know, I use minority in the, in the broad sense of the term. Any, any, anybody that's different, no right. matter what that is. Right. I think one thing that's been interesting, by the way, about the last 15 years is that I think it's sad, but I think a lot of politicians have, have exploited the other to kind of, yeah. you know, take power. You know, kind of, you know, as opposed to trying to be inclusive, you know, demonize certain groups, whether it's immigrants, Muslims in, in certain places. You know, this is this is a global phenomenon. It's not just happening in India. And I think uh, uh, what's happened is that that's been a pathway to power, uh, sadly, for some politicians. Has it? I mean, it, it does seem like a... Um the phenomenon is is taking taking on steam today but i also know that that's always been the case with politics demonizing the other is yeah. is the first tool in your political kit if you want to win election well, look, going back to my previous context you know hitler i mean that's like the most extreme example of it but demonizing jews and uh, I'm, not, I'm not at all comparing anyone currently to Hitler. I'm really not. That's it. But I'm, but I'm just saying that, you know, we go through different waves of history. Yeah. Uh, and I think we're now going through a particular period in which demonization of the other is a particularly favored technique, sadly. 
So I'm gonna I'm gonna try out my my half baked theory as to why this is the case. I think okay. I think I think everything in life again because of technology is more democratized. Uh, media is more democratized. Information is more democratized. Uh, voices are more democratized and you know like this idea that there would just be two parties where we all sort of neatly fit in one of those two buckets doesn't make any sense at all so a lot of the chaos um good and bad right now including the the rise of of uh, uh nationalism and you know I, I should pick on uh bernie's brand of of populism as well i mean these are all different flavors of the same thing um I feel like I feel like we're in the middle of a paradigm shift, and I'm hoping that we get to a beautiful place where more people have voices, but we're not uh, we're not using those voices to op- oppress other people, basically. And I don't know if, I don't know if that's true or not, but I'm I'm hopeful that that we're we're sort of going through this learning process. I certainly hope you're right. I'm not exactly sure what your theory is, but I I certainly feel that. Well, as, let, me, let me just say, as a journalist, just to take one example, as a former journalist, you know, it's easy to kind of be romantic about the good old days. Yeah. Maybe this is not where you're going, but, but this is where my head is going based on your conversation. But, you know, when I grew up, I'm, I think I'm guessing you're, I'm your age, I'm in my mid-50s, you know, there was, it, you know, journalism, there were some good elements of it, but it was basically the province of a few major national outlets, right? You had the three networks, you had the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the Washington Post. That was basically it. Yeah. And they kind of controlled the mass. And now, because of the internet, because of the rise of conservative talk radio, because of then the counter rise of liberal talk radio, you know, the rise of the internet, the rise of new websites, there's been, as you say, a complete democratization of the of, of the media. And that is in many ways a very good thing, right? People have genuine choices of the kind of information uh, that they can get. You know, what I get concerned about is um, that, you know, the weaponization of that sort of against democracy, right? That yeah. you can really, you know, really, there's much greater capacity to peddle really false information that can undermine people's faith in institutions, undermine people's faith in elections. And that I struggle with because I'm a fierce defender of the First Amendment and people's right to say what they want. But you also have a situation in which because of that, elections are potentially, the integrity of elections is threatened. So I'm not, sh- I, I'm not sure what to do about that. Yeah. Yeah. And I, my, my fallback is always to, to, to have more speech. And, and I do think that I think, by the way, I think more speech is basically a good antidote. Yeah. Uh, I think that, you know, it's funny. When people say bad things or say false things, in the current media ecosystem, they're either ignored or if they're noticed, then there's pushback. And then I think people can, you know, can get all, you know, can can get the... The right facts. It's a. I mean, it's it's a process, and and it it was always possible. Um, no offense to your former employer, but it was always always possible that the New York Times or the Washington Post would get something horribly wrong. Yeah. And when they had that big, um, big megaphone that w- it was sort of hard to to push back on, um, it was problematic. And I don't even have a specific instance in mind. Whereas you know. Let's say there are Russian bots or Chinese bots and, and or you know authoritarian governments that are trying to manipulate the conversation in the United States. There's also millions of, of citizen fact checkers that are going to call them out. And, Absolutely, and bots, push bots, back. But bots are kind of an interesting thing. I don't know. Like I I, I firmly I, I really am in favor of like actual people having rights. Mm-hmm. You know, does a bot have a right to free speech? Yeah. I don't know. That, that's that's a harder one. Yeah. So and so you you have you know you have the manipulation of social media and the creation of false narratives, which is absolutely part of this 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 chaos, mostly beautiful chaos of social media. 
But uh, when you talk about weaponizing that, I think of uh, I, I think of mass surveillance systems and, and the abuse of uh, individual privacy and, and uh, the penultimate version of that today appears to be what's going on in China with the social credit system there, where um, every aspect of your life is integrated into a government surveillance system. And, and if that isn't suppression of, of basic liberties and you know, any any quote unquote democratic outcome under that system to me is is a farce. Yeah, I find the Chinese social credit system to which you're alluding really one of the scariest developments. And I do think that it, it it's one of the things that leads me to conclude maybe people will disagree with this, but I do think that in the big picture, China is probably one of the greatest threats to human freedom. Yeah. Because you know, the idea that, you know, every part of your life is being reviewed by governments, by a government, you know, official somewhere, and that person has an ability to kind of then, you know, analyze those things, where you shop, you know, what grades you got, who you talk to, who your friends are, and that can then affect your life. That's incredibly scary. And part of the problem is that those same kind of tools are here for com- companies yeah. and governments, you know, in ostensibly free countries. And they, you know, China goes even further because it's linked to your, your finances and your bank account and, yeah. and they can cut you off. Yeah. And that, of course, is not anything that, that we would imagine happening in this country. Um, but the, you know, going back to the, the question of, of, of oppressing minority rights, mm-hmm. one, of the, one of the lesser told stories about China is what they're doing to the to the Uyghur Uyghur yeah the Uyghur, the Uyghur people is the Muslim people yeah. in in the western part of China and there's been an unbelievable repression of the Uyghurs uh, I think China in general is rare, is very worried about minority movements uh, because they feel that it threatens potentially you know, the unraveling of the, of the state. So you think of Tibet would be another yeah. case study where they've really seem to have gone overboard to repress the rights of the Tibetan people. Uh, and but 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 the Uyghurs are re- it's really fascinating and scary and frightening. Where uh, over the last summer, number of years they've moved about a million Uyghurs into effectively concentration camps that have been highlighted. There's been a lot of reporting about that now in the press. Probably doesn't get that much attention relative to some of these other issues, but you know they're not killing people by and large compared to like like what Stalin did or what uh, or what Hitler did. But you know they're 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 definitely you know using coercion and force to really uh, uh, try to force uh, a minority group to you know kind of give up its. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's belief system, it's way of life, infringes religious liberty. It's, it's very, very scary. Yeah. And, and again, just um, making sure that people are aware of this, you would, you would want our, our leaders to, to talk about this. Yes. And to make it clear that this is not an acceptable thing for governments to do to their people. You know, it's interesting. I do think that on the issue of China's violations of human rights and the violations against the Uyghurs in particular, the violations against Tibetans would be another case. Um, I do think there's bipartisan support for for pushing back against that. You know, even the Trump administration, which I think has not been the most, you know, friendly to a strong human rights policy. You know, Secretary Pompeo and others have really spoken out against the uh, against the uh, problems with the Uyghurs uh, again I'm sorry with the problems of the treatment of the Uyghurs yeah um, you know you got people like Marco Rubio who's been very active in in highlighting the uh, uh, the abuses of, of the protesters in Hong Kong and you've got Nancy Pelosi who kind of takes the same position as as, as Marco Rubio so I I think I mean, that, that's one thing that kind of gives me hope, that there's, that when you get kind of beyond the shores of the United States, there is some ag- agreement on, 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 on certain basic human rights policies. 
So what are some other hot spots? Uh, I pulled up the the worst of the worst, and and a lot of uh, places, uh, a few places. Well, I believe the worst this year is Syria. Yeah. Zero, uh, zero zero score zero that's, score that's pretty bad uh that's pretty bad and then i actually did happen to notice i looked at the you know north korea yeah would be another one though they have a score of four i'm not, I'm not sure like why they're not zero either <laughs> i'll have to check into that but that, that's a three so they're oh pretty, they're, they're three they're i thought close. they were four yeah. okay thank you for t- reminding me of that so I, to me the, the the most egregious countries are are probably syria and uh north korea um then on the other side, you know, you have the countries that get close to 100. They tend to be, I think, that there are three Scandinavian countries. Yeah. Uh, uh, Norway, Finland, and Sweden, which get scores of 100, I believe. Uh, and they, they, they do pretty well. And then you got everyone else in between. I think in terms of stories, uh, let me just, on the on the... I always like to talk about positive because you can tend to get negative about things. But I think there are two big African countries that I think are positive stories. One, we talked about a little bit, Sudan. Mm -hmm. The other is Ethiopia. Ethiopia had been for years kind of a Marxist military dictatorship. Uh, Actually, someone from the ruling party, Prime Minister uh, Abiy, uh, he was chosen by the ruling party, and they just thought he'd be a continuation, but he turned out to be kind of a reformer. And he let political prisoners go. He he allowed civil society to come back. And Ethiopia, I believe, has been one of the most significant gainers over the last uh, uh, two years of any country in the world. So those are, and by the way, Ethiopia and Sudan are really significant countries in Africa, very large populace. Another country that I think is a success story is Taiwan. Uh, Taiwan is 30 years ago, again, was really a, a dictatorship, a military dictatorship. And they remember, I think, you know, in the 70s, a lot of people say, hey, democracy can't take root in, in, in Asia. And Taiwan was one of the stories there. South Korea was another one that was run by military dictators. Uh, but, you know, now uh, Taiwan is one of our strongest, one of the strongest countries that are rated in our scores. They have a very thriving democracy. Uh, and in fact, um, and by the way, they really know the nature of the Chinese system, you know, on the mainland, and they don't like it. Mm-hmm. And in fact, so I think, and they were, they were, there was an effort, you know, we talk about interference in elections. Well, the Chinese made a major effort to try to get the other party to win in the recent elections here, and they, they failed miserably because people were very skeptical about it. So I do think one thing that I always like to tell people is that there are really positive stories to tell. But there is more negative than positive. Uh, and just a couple countries that I would mention that I think, I mean, Venezuela is, is a heartbreaking situation where Venezuela was in, before Chavez came to power, you know, one of the, uh, uh, the leading democratic lights in, in Latin America. And, and Chavez really showed what happens when you attack the rule of law, erode the rule of law, drive out civil society, drive out, uh, you know, uh, independent media. And today, uh, uh, Venezuela is one of the, you know, kind of an economic basket case. And it's really more yeah. m- more of an economic story in some ways than a democracy story. Yeah, like I wonder, and, and you don't explicitly use um, some measure of economic freedom, but the, the worst of the worst... Um, Venezuela. I, I don't know what the number is for Venezuela. I know they're unfree, but but I would have I would have think that they would become pretty close to zero. But um, they're a little bit up more than that. Yeah, I'm not I'm not sure why they're a little bit more th- than that. But, I mean, they, they, you know, they've had they've had some flashes of, a, of of you know of an independent judiciary, an independent parliament. You know, the the acting president that's been recognized by 50 or 60 countries is, yeah. you know, is, is a leader of the parliament. That's, so that's probably why. That's probably, yeah, yeah. that's probably why. Yeah. So how do people um, dig into this? We're going to remind them one more time. How do people dig into this and the, and the work that you guys do? Well, there's a lot of great information on our website. I hate to be so <laughs> advertising, but really, yeah. if you go to freedomhouse.org, uh, you, if you click on the map, there's a freedom map, Freedom House map, and you can really go to any country in the world. You can see how we score them. We're actually quite transparent about 
our scores. So we, we not only list the overall score of zero to 100, but we also say how we rated a country on specific sub indicators, so like rule of law or freedom of expression. And then we say why we scored it that way. So people sometimes, not sometimes, they often will disagree with us. Mm -hmm. But I think the process that we go through is very rigorous. We consult with a lot of uh, experts on the ground. Um, we try to really make sure that we're very nuanced and fair in our judgments. So um, uh, uh, I, the main thing is to go to our website and you can see how we score. Yeah, and it, it's, uh, you know, we're never going to agree um, probably on a lot of things. That's probably the very nature of the, of, of the democratic process we're talking about. But um, agreeing on the big things, the core things, uh, free, freedom of speech and, and autonomy and not politically persecuting um, minority rights. Um, these are these are common, I, I think, human values that, that we need to uh, uh, celebrate. I agree with you. And honestly, I think people, when you drill down into the things that we care about, there should be a lot of agreement. I mean, people believe in freedom of expression. They believe in having, being able to say what you want to say. People believe in having a strong rule of law, where you know there, you know there's there's clear guideposts for what's for what's legal and illegal that you can then have a judge fairly educate, you know, the decision there. So I really think there should be more agreement than disagreement. You know, so, you know you're going to sometimes just politics being politics, you're going to have some disagreement sometimes. I don't mean to be Pollyannish about it, and I think. In the current environment, sometimes oh, we're going to fight like cats and dogs. Let's, yeah. yeah, yeah. But in the current environment, which is so polarized in our country, you can sort of lose sight of, of the fact that there is a lot of agreement. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you for coming on, and and I'm going to agree with you on that last point. Well, I'm really thrilled to be here, and I really would, again would encourage your listeners to go to freedomhouse.org. There's a lot of great information, not just what we talked about today. But thank you very much for having me, Matt. I really enjoyed it. Cool. Thanks for watching Kibbe on Liberty. By now, you know this is the most important event of your week. So make sure you subscribe on YouTube. Click the little bell so you get notifications. Kibbe on Liberty, mostly honest conversations with mostly interesting people.